Again, it's great to see everybody out. Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Marshall Foster. I am the City Planning Director in Seattle's Department of Planning and Development. And what I'm going to do tonight is kind of introduce the program and what's in store for this evening. And um, I'll kind of tee up a little bit of the history of the work we've been doing on the waterfront. As I think you all know, the topic of tonight is streets and transit. And we have been at, hard at work on the future of this waterfront for many years. Um, it depends on when you start counting, but actually we have articles in the archives in our office that go back to the late 60s talking about the need to bring down the Alaskan Way viaduct and reconnect Seattle back to Elliott Bay, where our city started. And so um, if you want to think of it that way, we've been working on it for 40 or 50 years. Um, more recently, in 2009, 2010, when the decisions around the transportation solution to State Route 99 started getting resolved, and the decisions on how we would replace that state route, the city initiated a new effort to really define the future of the central waterfront. With the removal of the Alaskan Way Viaduct in 2016, uh, which is a critical step, which is now established policy, and I think we should all take a moment to celebrate the fact that the, water, the viaduct is coming down. <laughs> now really is the time for us to get real and get serious about how we take advantage of this opportunity and reclaim the waterfront for this city. Um, as many of you know, based on that work that started in 2010, we did about two years of, of pretty intensive community engagement. Um, I recognize a lot of the faces tonight of folks who've been, who have been part of that process. Um, really, we started with what are the goals, what do we want to see on our waterfront, what are the principles, and I'll remind you of some of those in a moment. And we re, uh, ultimately, we got to a concept design, a vision for with the viaduct removed, what kind of a place could we create on the waterfront? And that was ultimately endorsed by our city council and our mayor last August. And so um, some of the vision that uh, you'll be seeing tonight is building on what at this point is an established uh, city plan for how we will take advantage of this tremendous opportunity when the viaduct comes down. A few uh, images just to give you some context. For those of you who are new to the project, what we're really focusing on tonight is the areas you see in yellow. That's the footprint of the Alaskan Way Viaduct uh, as it exists today. It also includes some of the key east-west connections back into the downtown. I was just having a conversation at one of the tables um, about the importance not only of the waterfront, but of all the east-west connections that are going to weave our city back into that waterfront and make it easy to get in and out from the waterfront. That space alone represents 20 to 22 acres of new parks, trails, public spaces that will be made available to the city. The foundation for this whole project is the replacement of the Elliott Bay seawall. And you see a thin green line on that map that represents the seawall. Um, thanks, um, those of you who supported the bond measure last November, um, Seattle came out uh, at a record margin of 77% in support of a $290 million bond measure to replace that seawall. It's fundamental public infrastructure. It supports our entire downtown. It really is the foundation of this whole project. If you think of this project as a house that we're building, in many ways, um, this is the foundation. The, the downtown is the house, and the waterfront is kind of the front porch that we're trying to create. And then the last piece on this diagram is you see a couple of purple, purple uh, dots in there, purple projects. Those are partner projects. There's, they're very important to this, and there's also a very large green one at Coleman Dock. Um, we're working closely with Pike Place Market, which is doing some critical uh, development in the market to expand its uses. Seattle Aquarium is looking at an expansion program, and the state of Washington is replacing Coleman Dock. The, the terminal is, is at a point where it needs to be replaced. So there's a lot of change that's going to be happening over the next eight to 10 years on the waterfront. This plan, what you're going to be learning about tonight, is really looking at all of those elements. An exciting piece is um, last year we got our first taste of taking down the viaduct. OK, and I hope you all got to take this in. This was one of the cr uh, machines that was removing the viaduct segment 
at the south by the stadiums. And then more recently, we've watched the arrival of the deep bore tunnel machine and the excavation of the bathtub, as we call it, in south downtown area, preparing for the state's efforts to actually bore the new tunnel, State Route 99, which will go under downtown Seattle. It's important to note that project really is the thing that creates the opportunity for this waterfront because it frees up all that space on the downtown waterfront. This is just a close-up of the seawall. Uh, to give you a flavor, this um, is a major part of what will be replaced uh, when seawall construction begins. And just to note that seawall construction actually is beginning this September. So this is moving very quickly. You'll start seeing real changes on the waterfront in the next few months. Now, I mentioned at the beginning, we started this effort uh, and, and organized it around a set of guiding principles. Um, many, many of you, literally tens of thousands of Seattleites helped us really arrive at some fundamentals of what we're trying to achieve. The first principle that I want to emphasize is that we're trying to create a waterfront for all. And this actually goes back to a concept that Allied Arts, which is a nonprofit here in Seattle, created uh, many years ago, that the waterfront should be about democratic public space. This is a project that is public. It's about Seattleites enjoying their waterfront. Um, and that we should really preserve the space on the waterfront for public use and enjoyment in perpetuity. So everything that you're going to see tonight in terms of the visions here are about the city investing in public space. This isn't about development. That's a question we get a lot about condominiums or private investment. There's certainly some of that that we're already seeing interest uh, from adjacent properties. But in terms of the, the core city project, it's about how we invest back in our public spaces. The other key idea here is you'll notice that the Port of Seattle is back there in the background. One of the things that really sets Seattle's waterfront apart from many other cities is that we are still a working city. We have a tremendous manufacturing and industrial heart that gives the city much of its character. Um, in my office in planning, we track how much employment is in different segments in the city. 25% of Seattle's jobs are still in manufacturing uses. We've heard loud and clear that people want us to keep that working character and not create a sort of passive, um, you know, anesthetized waterfront. We really want to have a place that celebrates our industrial character. One of the key ways that that issue comes out is how we design the street itself. And Alaskan Way, um, the core street that we're going to focus on tonight, is a really important part of this project. It really defines a corridor where we're going to be not only providing spaces for people to get back to the waterfront, but making sure that freight can move through this corridor efficiently, making sure people can come and go from Coleman Dock and all the, the um, traffic on the ferries that's essential, as well as creating a place for people, for pedestrians, for cycling, uh, for enjoying the waterfront. The second big idea is really taking in the setting. Elliott Bay is a remarkable natural asset that we have, that we were built on that bay. We enjoy remarkable views through the downtown out to the water, and the design of this is really meant to celebrate that. I mentioned the working waterfront. You know, the waterfront is a crossroads. Um, the fact that we have the, the, the sort of heart of the Washington State ferry system, Coleman Dock, eight million people a year use this dock to come in and out of Seattle. We want to make that an exciting core element of what we're doing here. And then the last thing I wanted to point out was that we really heard from people throughout the process the importance of culture and activity on the waterfront. This is a picture of the concerts on the pier. How many people remember the concerts on the pier? Okay, good, most of you do. So these used to happen down at Pier 62, 63, and people loved this. The fact that we used to have these major events where the whole city could come together, enjoy sunset, looking out over the Olympic Mountains, Key part of this project is bringing space for music on the waterfront, for public art, for commerce, all those things to be part of it. We want to have public space, we want to have places to sit and enjoy the view, but it's perfectly fine to also be able to grab a cup of coffee, grab a drink with friends, enjoy a concert, that type of thing. Now I mentioned the process. Uh, I just want to emphasize this, we've had a very broad engagement around this. You see some of the different types of ways we've worked with people uh, throughout the process. We're doing a lot of that same type of work tonight. When we talk about the street, which is going to be the focus of our presentation tonight, one of the key things we've heard from people is that it needs to accommodate all the users. I mentioned some freight, 
motorists, transit is a key use here, um, bicycle, pedestrians. People also really emphasized for us how important it was to have a human-scaled street. They didn't want to see Alaskan Way turn into such a large thoroughfare that it wasn't attractive and easy to get across it and that it wouldn't be intimidating. And so that's something we've really tried to keep in mind as we've gone through this process. I'm not going to go into it in detail tonight, but in terms of the vision of the plan and the actual design ideas, they operate at three scales. The first scale looks at the entirety of Seattle. It looks at the whole city and how we can bring the city back to Elliott Bay. And you'll see on the left side of the, of the screen a, a big yellow ring around Elliott Bay, stretching from West Seattle, the downtown, up to Myrtle Edwards Park and beyond. And the vision there is to create a whole series of public spaces around that ring that will really make Elliott Bay a center again and, and give people reasons to enjoy it as well as connecting out and having streets that are improved to help people get down to that. The middle diagram looks at the scale of the city as a whole, at, at the center city, and all the neighborhoods that are adjacent to the waterfront. The real emphasis here is on how do the neighborhoods like Belltown, Pioneer Square, the downtown connect into this waterfront? And the emphasis here is on east-west connections. Streets like Union Street, Streets like Maine and Washington and Pioneer Square. How do we make it easy if you're up at Third Avenue in the downtown to get right down to the waterfront and know that there's an attractive way to do it? It's quite challenging to be candid because of the topography we have downtown. And so you'll see we have some proposals to actually create ways to, to make it easier to bridge that topography. Things like elevators, escalators, other tools to make it easy and comfortable to get up and down the hill. And then the last uh, diagram on the right looks at the scale of the waterfront itself and how do we get people back to the water. Something we heard repeatedly was the simple joy of getting down to the water. It might be throwing a stone in the water if, if you're bringing your kids or just having the chance to really be on the bay and experience the natural setting of the shoreline itself. And so we're looking at, at opportunities to make that happen that you'll see tonight. All that work has distilled down to a set of core projects, which are outlined in pink on this diagram. Those represent what the city, working with the state, the port, um, a whole group of partners is intending to implement over the next eight years. From now until essentially 2020, this is the picture of improvements. The key piece is removing the Alaskan Way viaduct, demolishing the viaduct, decommissioning the Battery Street Tunnel, core element is replacing the Alaskan Way and providing a new urban street. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. You see some of the key east-west connections that are reaching back into the downtown, as well as providing a whole series of public spaces on the waterfront. And I'm just going to kind of tease you right now with a few images of what we think that can look like. And then I'm going to hand it over to Angie Brady, who will have the hard work of actually walking you through the details of this. This is an image of what we think the promenade will look like. Um, when the waterfront is opened up and the viaduct is removed, um, it frees up between 60 and 80 feet of space along the water side. And we're, we're being careful to really focus on the water side to create a public promenade where you'll, where you'll be able to enjoy the water's edge, enjoy the businesses there, as well as have some major new landscaping elements, new lighting to make sure it's safe and attractive year round. And this is just a bit of the character that we think that space could have. This is an image of what one of the new street intersections might look like. And I mentioned earlier accommodating all the users of the street. You'll see here there are wide, generous sidewalks. Um, in this particular case, the sidewalks are going to be about twice as wide as they are today along Alaskan Way. A two-way cycle track. And what that two-way cycle track is going to provide is a buffered, protected uh, cycle facility for people on the waterfront it's envisioned both for commuters, fast-moving cyclists, but it could also be a place where you might bring your child to learn how to ride a bike, um, a, a, a facility for all um, users and abilities. You also see crosswalks, um, a lot of emphasis on making the street easy to cross, as well as simple things like overhead weather protection. If you're waiting for a bus, um, you should be able to wait for a bus and not get soaked in the process. Um, so really trying to think about the kind of the human experience. This is an image of one of the spaces uh, that we'll be creating. Um, this looks at uh, the space where, where Union Street, excuse me, where Waterfront Park is today, creating a large public plaza there. Uh, you'll see some more images of this later. 
And really connecting from Pike Place Market um, and Victor Steinbrook Park, where you've got a great view out over the waterfront, and bringing that down to the level of the water itself um, so that you can move easily back and forth. This gives you an image of what it would look like uh, to be looking out from what we call the Overlook Walk, which will be a new connection that spans between the waterfront and Pike Place Market. And one of the things we also heard from a lot of people was the remarkable views that we enjoy from the viaduct today. I think we all have a certain sweet spot for the view you have when you drive the viaduct. What this will do is actually give you that same type of view experience, but allow you to do it outside your car as a place you could actually go, sit, have a picnic, have a cup of coffee, that type of thing. So this is just kind of to quickly give you a little uh, taste of what the waterfront vision looks like as a whole. This is the image of what the waterfront looks like today. Uh, you see the viaduct uh, cutting off the city from the waterfront, and you see some of the uh, piers and the other improvements that are there. This is what it looks like when you remove the viaduct in 2016. Provide the new surface road, the new Alaskan Way, um, which will be a four-lane urban street. You see the new public promenade, which if I can point these out, you see the promenade running along here, trees, landscaping, lighting, that sort of thing. Uh, new connections from the city, like the connection from the market down to the waterfront here, as well as renovation of some of the overwater public parks, Pier 6263, Waterfront Park, which I showed you a moment ago, and some others as well. I'm not going to go into them all right now. So that is uh, a quick summary, and I apologize because I, uh, it's hard to summarize this whole plan uh, briefly. But what we're going to do now, and I'm going to introduce Angela Brady, um, who will kind of uh, step, walk you through the, the waterfront street, um, is really get down to the level of the street design itself and, and kind of how does that particular piece of this equation fit with the rest of it. So please join me in welcoming Angela. So I'm Angela Brady. I'm the city's waterfront program manager, and my job is to successfully manage the design and construction of the overall program. So as Marshall said, there are two major pieces here that I want to focus on tonight. Um, that is the design of Alaskan Way itself, the street design, and also to cover some of the analysis that we've done on options for local waterfront transit. The most important thing for us tonight, though, is to hear from you. Um, this room is designed for discussion, comments. You see large roll plots all around the room. Um, we have um, a ton of staff, small army of city staff, design consultants, um, passionate waterfront volunteers ready to take your questions and explain the program in a little bit more detail. Um, so just encourage you to walk around the room and share your thoughts. So the overall vision for Alaskan Way is to create a great urban street for all users. Um, that includes accommodating pedestrians, bicyclists, transit, freight, cars, parking, and more. Also to provide effective regional connections, um, as well as improved local east-west connections. It's very important to us to integrate the street into the overall design of the waterfront while also preserving um, a very high quality public realm. And, Mar and Marshall uh, went through that a little bit with you earlier. So just to orient you, um, Alaskan Way extends from uh, South King Street to Pine Street. It's shown in red in this graphic. Um, that's, the street will actually be built within the footprint of the existing viaduct. We'll also be reconstructing Elliott Way which will extend into Belltown to the north, and that's shown in orange or yellow in this graphic. Marshall mentioned that uh, east-west connections are part of the core project in terms of the overall program. They're very important in creating um, a great urban street and critical for, for access um, and mobility in terms of moving in and out of the city and getting people to and from the waterfront. As part of the east-west connections, we will be reconstructing uh, both Columbia and Seneca. Uh, clearly, we'll, are currently occupied by on and off ramps from the viaduct. So we'll be uh, rebuilding those streets. We're also um, focused on a couple of other east-west connections that are shown here. So from the south, we'll be reconstructing a railroad way, South Main and South Washington Street within Pioneer Square, uh, Marion Street Bridge, which is the pedestrian connection between Coleman Dock and First Avenue, as well as Union Street, um, a major pedestrian connection between First Avenue and the waterfront. Um, 
Marshall mentioned the Overlook Walk, which will connect Pike Place Market down to the waterfront, very critical, and Bell Street up in Belltown. So some of the street design elements that are critical to in accomplishing our goals are um, listed above, or listed on the screen in front of you. So we're providing two general purpose vehicle lanes in each direction along the entire corridor. Number two, we're providing a north-south bicycle route, continuous. Three, building a promenade along the entire west um, edge of Alaskan Way, as well as pedestrian crossings. Um, we're also providing for curb space for parking and deliveries, as well as providing for transit service and connections, um, ferry access to Coleman Dock, and just a reminder that Alaskan Way is a major freight route, so accommodating freight is very important as well. So I'll start with a promenade, and uh, Marshall did give you some teasers on this, but uh, uh, this is a pedestrian-focused space running along the west side of Alaskan Way, created by shifting Alaskan Way to the east, back into the footprint of the viaduct. It'll be a place to sit, to stroll, to shop, to, to be with family. It'll be wide enough to encourage spill out of adjacent businesses, um, for example, with sidewalk cafes. Last summer, the city commissioned a pedestrian count study that found that on, a, on an average Saturday during the summer, there were approximately 35,000 pedestrians walking up and down the waterfront. So it's really critical that we accommodate that number, but also plan for growth of that number. Just another graphic, um, looking north, and I think Marshall had this in his presentation as well, um, providing a promenade to allow for walking the entire length of the waterfront for exercise or enjoyment, or just to use as a quick walk to your favorite destination. So bicycles. Um, to the east of the promenade, but still west of Alaskan Way, we're building a new bicycle facility. It's continuous along the north-south direction. Um, in July of 2012, as part of our concept design, we showed a multi-use trail that combined bicycles and pedestrians into the same space. Since then, in working with our ex external stakeholders, um, including the bicycle community, pedestrian groups, as well as using in-house um, cycling experts, we've refined that design to be a two-way cycle track. So what is a two-way cycle track? Um, it's a state-of-the-art bicycle facility. It'll be safe, reliable, and well-connected. It'll be a separ separated from vehicle lanes and also from the pedestrian promenade. It encourages uh, the use by a wide range of cyclists, including the novice cyclists all the way up to the high-speed commuters. And we've used best practices in cycle track design, and we're going to share a couple of graphics here with you as well. So this is a graphic showing what a two-way cycle track might look like um, in between blocks. <clears throat> you can see a landscape buffer along the west side of the cycle track, separating the cycle track from the promenade. As well, a landscape buffer and a parking lane protecting the east side of the cycle track. Uh, the cycle track could be grade separated, you see curbs on either side. Um, that would serve as a visual and physical cue to encourage pedestrians to stay out of the cycle track, which would eliminate those conflicts. This is a graphic that shows what that cycle track would look like at an intersection. The cycle track is intended to read more like the street, um, where bicyclists would actually stop at the signalized intersections with traffic to allow for safe pedestrian crossings. So freight, um, Alaskan Way is a major truck route. I just wanted to mention that tonight. There are um, only three major freight corridors through the city of Seattle, SR99, Alaskan Way, and I-5. So uh, accommodating the movement of goods and services through downtown Seattle is very critical. Local waterfront transit, um, I'm gonna touch on this just just very briefly now, and then I'm going to get into it a little bit more as we move, move on toward the end of the, of the presentation. Um, this map indicates the many available transit choices and connections to and from the downtown core, and increasingly to the waterfront, including rapid ride on 3rd Avenue, First Hill Streetcar connecting First and Jackson, um, a planned new rapid trolley service on Madison connecting directly to Coleman Dock, and a new Southwest Transit pathway on Columbia and Alaskan Way, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, that pathway will bring 50 buses an hour at peak periods to Coleman Dock Transit Hub. 
we have studied five different options for local waterfront access, transit access. Um, these include uh, two different options on the historic streetcar, an option for the, running the modern streetcar, and two rubber tire options. The good news is that each of these can work in a shared street with traffic, um, providing for the most, use, most efficient use of our street space. And again, I'm going to get into more detail on the, on the waterfront transit here in a minute. So let's um, move to the functions of the street. So just to orient you, um, let's see here. South is to your left, north is to your right. Uh, the street functions for Alaskan Way vary depending on where you are along the corridor. South end demand is, ex south end demand is extremely high. Um, we're accommodating full-time dedicated transit lanes in each direction two general purpose lanes, um, plus we're maintaining access to and from a very busy ferry terminal at Coleman Dock. So these demands all create for a very hard working street at the south end. Traffic volumes are anticipated to be around 35,000 vehicles a day. With less demand as you move north, so therefore a narrower street as you move to the north with traffic volumes dropping to more like 24,000 vehicles a day. Due to the varying street demands, um, we've divided the street into three sections based on street function and associated design. So I'm gonna walk you through the corridor from north to south, and I'm gonna go fairly quickly, so please keep in mind there are large roll plots, as I said, on six tables in the back here, so you can stare at those at your heart's content and try and sort out um, exactly what it is I'm explaining to you right now. So from Madison to Pine Street, Um, this street is relatively narrow with two general purpose lanes in each direction, including shared local waterfront transit lanes and associated transit stops, as well as some curb parking and loading. Um, along the west side of the street, you can see the wide promenade with an opportunity to provide kiosks and other ways to activate the space. In brown, you can see the two-way cycle track, which is buffered by plantings on either side. This is an axon showing you what that um, section of the street might look like at the intersections. This is a, in particular, this is um, the intersection at Seneca Street and Alaskan Way. And this is a closer view of what um, Seneca Street might look like at the intersection. So moving from Yesler Way to Madison Street, um, in this center section near Coleman Dock between Yesler Way and Madison, the street demand starts to increase. Um, so here we're maintaining two general purpose lanes in each direction, but we're adding a lane on both sides of the street for full-time dedicated transit, beginning at Columbia and heading south. Here we have many more curbside uses at what, what we are calling a transit hub, which is located just adjacent to Coleman Dock. And those uses include transit stops, ADA access to the terminal, taxi drop-off and pickup, pedestrians arriving on, on the Marion Street Bridge and crossing Alaskan Way, and bicycles entering the terminal. Note that this, this plan shows where a streetcar stop would potentially be located in the median. If we go with the rubber tire option, um, the local waterfront transit stop would be located on the sidewalks or adjacent to the sidewalks. This is an example axon of what Columbia would look like at Columbia and Alaskan Way. Here you can see all day transit lanes on Alaskan Way connecting to transit lanes um, on Columbia Street, providing fast and reliable trips for more than 22,000 transit riders a day from Southwest King County. And just a plug, um, King County is here tonight and they're gonna be floating around the room. So if you have any questions related to transit, please grab one of them and ask some questions. In this graphic, you can also see a cycle track um, shown on the west side of the street. So along with the wider sidewalks directly adjacent to the west side curb to accommodate larger pedestrian volumes arriving and departing the transit hub area. And this is a rendering showing what um, the intersection at Columbia Street would look like at Al on Alaskan Way. Um, this is actually 
standing on the promenade side looking south uh, toward the stadiums. So moving to the south, from South King to Yesler, uh, the street here has two lanes of general purpose traffic in each direction, dedicated transit lanes in each direction, and ferry queuing lanes in the northbound direction to accommodate Coleman Dock. Um, this graphic depicts the northbound dual left turn pockets at the Yesler Way intersection. And um, I need to note here that we are showing, if you look between Main and Washington Street, we're actually showing a wide landscaped median. Uh, in working with WashDOT as well as Washington State Ferries, they have requested that we provide for an extended ferry queue lane along that block. Um, this obviously is not shown here yet, but we're working to make that change and make that happen. And the design team is working very hard in terms of the urban design to, to make sure that we aren't creating, you know, a much wider section there with a uh, ton more concrete, but just to, to try and buffer that a little bit with a nice wide median and landscaping. So this is an example of the intersection at Washington Street and Alaskan Way. Uh, you can see the dual left turn pockets turning, beginning north of um, South Washington. Again, we're looking here at extending those dual left turn lanes to the south. And here's a potential view at South Washington Street and Alaskan Way based on our design team's vision. You can see the cycle track on the right as well as the median and the crosswalk. So one important thing to note is that, particularly in the south end, uh, the street is relatively large. We've been working with our design team and looking at examples and typologies around the world um, for other great streets and, and taking points in terms of how we can use some of their design features um, to help us to reduce, what, reduce the scale of the street a bit. Four key ideas have risen to the surface, and we're focused on incorporating these ideas into our design. I've got them listed here. Um, number one is providing adequate sidewalk scale relative to the street scale. So if the street is 100 feet wide, we should be providing at least that much for, for the pedestrians and the public realm. Two is providing adequate buffers between pedestrians and traffic. That could be landscaped medians, could be landscape buffers. Um, also providing pedestrian-oriented intersection designs and um, providing design medians at relative scale to the street. And this graphic depicts um, some examples of things that we could do, um, from, examples from other cities of things they've done to accommodate um, a wide street. So local waterfront transit. I'm going to spend just a few minutes on local waterfront transit before letting you get up and check out all of the great information around the room and ask questions and provide feedback. We've been seriously studying um, local waterfront transit options now uh, for several months, knowing that we need service that accomplishes many, many goals. One is to serve local waterfront, the local waterfront transit market one that operates in a shared street lane with traffic, um, a, a transit service that provides for frequent stops, one that is user-friendly and easy to navigate, that fits the waterfront character and demand, um, a service that's compelling, that's a compelling alternative to driving, and also complementary to other downtown transit. Again, here are the ideas we're studying. Two historic streetcar options, a modern streetcar option, and two rubber tire options, both a minibus and a coach. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate that all of these options under study could run in shared lanes in the street, and all can be made to work with the current street design concept. A report is out for public review. A decision is expected on this element until early 2014, later this year, early 2014. So the two options studied for historic streetcar, option A and option B. Um, option A includes a lower level of investment, doors on both sides of the vehicle along with additional operators, um, providing high platforms. Option B includes all um, elements under option A, 
but also includes elective upgrades such as um, automated door operation, improved lighting, similar power service as a modern streetcar, wheelchair lifts, and low platforms to accommodate access at standard curbs. The modern streetcar is um, used in other parts of Seattle, including South Lake Union and the upcoming First Hill Streetcar. Um, this is also being studied as an option. Uh, rubber tire transit. For rubber tire transit, we looked at both a minibus and also a coach style bus. Both would be battery operated with zero emissions. Um, option A, the minibus includes large side windows and exterior row seating, low floor boarding, and lower, obviously lower passenger capacity. Option B, the coach style bus includes um, two doors, it's a bigger bus, and incorporates higher passenger capacity, clearly. This graphic depicts what the alignment might look like, um, actually for each of the options. This one is shown for the historic streetcar, but they're all pretty basic. Um, this route is a basic route for all of the options. Uh, the route analyzed extends from Broad Street at the north end to either Main or Jackson Street and Pioneer Square. The difference would be um, between the historic streetcar and the modern streetcar is that we could potentially connect with a modern streetcar, we could co potentially connect into the first Hill Streetcar line at Jackson Street. Um, note that we're taking all of the local transit off of the waterfront at Yesler to avoid the very challenging and congested area south of Yesler. So this route would also be utilized with both rubber tire options as well. This is a cross section depicting what um, what a streetcar, how a streetcar could run between Madison and Spring. Um, this is just an example. Um, so the key differences to think about between streetcar and rubber tire options are the location where it runs in the street. A streetcar would actually run in the inside lanes, and you can see that depicted here, using center median platforms. The rubber tire transit option, Here, this is a section showing you what that might look like. Um, rubber tire would run in the outside curb lanes, stopping in lane to pick up and drop off passengers. Um, obviously would be a much cheaper option than the streetcar options because it requires less infrastructure and lower operating costs. So we spent a long time looking at many, many factors in analyzing all of these options. Uh, as I said earlier, the draft report is available online. We also have copies here tonight at the local waterfront transit station. It's important to note that local waterfront improvement transit wouldn't be implemented until the project is completed with construction, which we're looking at 2019. Um, we also have uh, large display boards summarizing our analysis over here at the, at the back of the room on my right and your left. Um, and note that we will not be making a decision on, on this issue um, until early next year, but your input tonight is critical and valuable as we continue looking at these options and exploring what we could do. So with that, I wanna thank you for um, being here and bringing your energy to help shape our future waterfront. We're very lucky to have so many people engaged in this process. I'd like to invite everybody to get up and stretch your legs. Uh, please share your thoughts with us throughout the room. Um, and thank you very much.